Okay, so now we're going to tackle anti symmetry. Where we essentially have an anti, we have a plane across this plane, and we want to um, we can identify this as anti symmetry when if I were to fold the structure across this, everything is symmetric except for the loading, which is anti symmetric. And what I mean with that anti symmetric loading is that the arrows all act from the same point, but they point in opposite directions and they have the same magnitude, but they point in opposite directions. So if I clap this thing closed, I can see the arrow is down here, and this one is up there. This one is going left here, and this one is going. Um, and I clap it, this one will, will point towards the outside. It will, this, look, this arrow is going towards its edge. If I clap it closed, it will still go towards the edge. So they'll point from opposite directions, although they'll act from the same point. Okay, that's it. So anti symmetry, geometric is symmetrical, prescribed displacements are symmetrical, material is symmetrical, but the loading is anti symmetrical. When that's the case, we can reduce the model by saying on that symmetry plane, sorry, on that anti-symmetry plane, we have horizontal rollers as opposed to vertical rollers that we had for the symmetry plane. So this is the only difference when it comes to the modeling. And again, it's not an approximation, it's exact. Okay? And obviously, if I reflect information across this, what you can just see here clearly, if this is going up here, things will be going down here. So there's going to be a negative reflection on the displacements as I map stuff across this. Okay. So that's really just to make sure that we're all on the same page. So let's look at an example. And let's visualize the full problem that we can appreciate it. Okay, so here's an example. Pulling on this side, pushing on this side, I can see geometry is symmetric, boundary conditions are symmetric, material is symmetric, and we're pushing here and we're pulling there so I can reflect things across that plane. Okay, that's beautiful. Okay, so now we can say there's a problem, an input file. Um, that This is again, I'm not going to do it. I want you to be able to do this. Take time and do this. Open the beams for elements Q load. This is a four elements problem. See everything is correctly applied. The forces open the two beam elements. See that the everything is correctly applied, as well as the boundary conditions are correctly applied. Remember, if I cut on this plane here, horizontal rollers. That's important. Okay, so let's run this and see what we get out. Let me run this and we magnify a thousand times. You can see here on this side we're pulling up, we're pushing down, and here in the middle when we have this anti-symmetry plane. What we'll see is essentially is there's only going to be there's only rolling that happened. Okay, so that's essentially what that was down to. So let maybe reduce the magnification to 100. Run it again. See if you can see anything. But what you would see here in the model is so here we have some vertical displacements on that symmetry plane. Uh, sorry, on that anti-symmetry plane, we essentially have zero vertical displacements. We only have moving towards left and right. Okay, that's important. And you can see why this left and right movement would happen there, because essentially what I'm applying here is on this plane here. That's essentially the the plane where um, that will be sort of pushing and pulling, because it's almost like a couple that we apply. If we apply load like this and like this, we are applying a moment, and on that anti-symmetry plane, things are only moved left and right because of that uh, influence of that couple. That's essentially what it boils down to. Okay. Uh, if I go and I look at the two element solution, I can run that again. Let me make it a thousand again so I get the exaggerated one. Uh, look at this one, boom. I can see essentially there's the solution that we get out. This is again modeling this now at the left end edge. So oh, there's no, something is not, not the same here. Now we're going on here. It's obviously a, something is a type of miss. Symmetry. What is the name of the file? Beam 2 Q8 load 2. So this is clearly not fixed. Uh, what? That's the rollers here are. Yeah, so they uh, allow only vertical. A horizontal displacement, no vertical displacement, that's perfectly fine. The issue here is I'm only clamping it at one point, I'm not clamping it everywhere, so this is something you have to modify. So it's 1, 10, and 15 has to be in there as well. Okay, that's something that you'd be, you'd be able to do quite easily in your own steam. So let's go back to the input file 1, 10, 15. Okay, 
now we can run this again this is the why it's important that you just double check that things are always correct because on purpose some of them are not going to be correct and you have to be able to modify them oh well the numbering was one six and nine that's half mesh my apology i went down one ten fifteen on the full mesh one six nine Bob's your uncle. Okay, beautiful. Now we can start seeing this looks the way it's supposed to look. And here I can see uh, things moving left and uh, right only horizontally. No vertical displacements. Okay, and if I look at that solution and look at this full solution here, you can start seeing pretty much same solution okay just visually inspected but we can we need to quantify the numbers to make sure but you can see here on this plane here only left and right movement uh, so it looks it looks quite nice you can see here essentially somewhere here is the middle and that's essentially that movement we had there and then here at the top it was moving to the left okay let's look at the numbers quantify them so you are pulling out displacements at node 5 and I can see here this is the displacement this is the displacement and zero zero numerically equivalent okay it's not uh, approximation it's exactly the same well me says that the first four nodes uh first four nodes for each element so boom boom uh so this is now what i have for the full mesh doing the same running it for the half mesh look at those values they are spot on the same look at these values spot on the same okay Look at the displacements, look at the bottom row for the full structure and the half node structure, and then the difference that we're going to be looking at. And now you will be able to compare and say, look at those displacements, look at those displacements, see here, spot on the same. And if I look at the difference, the difference is numerically zero. Beautiful. Can you see that? That's stunning. Okay, so that's really to put that down, to put that to bed, that we understand that this anti symmetry holds. Uh, things are now moving left and right so that dear to that sort of pushing and pulling of that couple that we had around there okay so next thing is um, we can do an extension of the problem this one I'm not going to do I'm going to leave it in your hands again to do applying a G here and a G here so you can go and compare and see how they compare okay that's important Then, what another problem I want you to be able to do is to say, yes, uh, this problem, model it with a, um, model this with a form noted elements. So this is what I want you to be able to do to say, give it a go, generate your own input file, um, and have these six nodes, two meshes, two elements, and do your in own input file from scratch. So this is really what I would like you to be able to do, and model this symmetrical problem. Okay. And then I want you to say, model this problem. This is now a different problem. And you can do this the way you want, with uh, as you wish. You can do this with, uh, um, with uh, Q8 or Q4. Um, and I would like you to really to give this a go. So this is, this is part of the uh, assignment that you, that's on your, your um, table. And I'm going to give an answer away now, so that those of you that are stuck know what to do. So this is obviously something simple. This is now just Q4 elements, so this is something you, you can now do in your own Steam. This is not, uh, so this is not going to be difficult. This this one might require just a little bit of uh, thinking before you can actually solve this. And so what it's, this is going to be about is, when I do linear superposition between a symmetric and an anti-symmetric problem. Okay let's see what happens so it's going to it's a combining superposition linear and a symmetric and anti-symmetric problem and i want you to see what's happening so i'm going to look at this this problem here this is our anti-symmetric problem okay and then i'm going to look at this problem here as our symmetric problem okay and if i essentially say let's do the full let's look at the full one first so that you understand what we are modeling if i take this problem the full problem here and i add it to the full problem here what would happen? Well, the force that was down at the top on the symmetric one will be 2F. 
So they'll, they'll be, if I have this problem that I mo model and the f symmetric one that I model on top of each other, the symmetric one has a force of F down, okay? And that will amplify this force to 2F. The symmetric one has a force of F down, and the anti-symmetric has a force of F up. Okay, this is now when the two unit length is on the same distance where the forces act on the symmetric and anti-symmetric problem. But this force that goes down, this force that goes up will cancel out. So what I'm left with is a 2F that's being applied with no force there if I were to superimpose those two solutions. Can you see that? So superimposing this solution, we have the two forces down and on top of this solution here would uh, uh, result in a 2F down here and a zero here because those two forces would cancel out. And that allows me then to model something that looks like this where I essentially have a single load that's being applied. The only difference is in the example that I sh showed you now the load would have been applied on this side. Okay, that's the only difference. But allows me to do that. So if I were to do model then the structure in, as half with essentially the uh, s uh, a force of F2 applied on the symmetric and a force of F2 applied on an anti-symmetric, then the F2s, F over 2s would add up on this side and because of the symmetry and anti-symmetric boundary condition, we would essentially have equivalence of no load applied on that side. You see that? So what I do is I'm going to build two models. One model where I split the model in half with a symmetric boundary condition and an anti-symmetric boundary condition. And all I do is I apply the load of F over 2 on both the symmetric and anti-symmetric boundary condition uh, uh, half structures. If I were to superimpose them, that would result F over 2 plus F over 2 would result in F. That will be the total force here. And on the other side, the the symmetry boundary condition implies that the force would be down. The anti-symmetry boundary condition would imply that this force would be up. And that's essentially what we have. And so this is how easy it is to model something that is uh, uh, loading that is not symmetric or anti-symmetric. But if I combine it with linear superposition and I think a little bit about the problem, I can model something as this and then save time. So what I do end up with is, is essentially modeling half, two halves as opposed to one full structure. And there's still a savings because that bandwidth scaling um, that's typically involved would result in me winning quite substantially when I want to try to solve this. So if I solve this and I think about it as a fairly dense matrix, um, then essentially I would end up with um, uh, two to the power of uh, two n to the power of three. So it would be eight times as, l as long for the full if I if I double the number of nodes of the full problem. Um, actually, I don't have to reason about the doubling of the nodes. Before, I just have to reason about uh, if I reduce, yeah, if, let's just do it double the size. So the full the full problem is twice the size than half the problem. So if I do that, it's eight times longer that I have to wait. Uh, well, for modeling the full problem, and I have two uh, two end problems that I have. So I will win four times um, because I'm modeling two n dimensional problems okay and the two n and the two n dimensional problem will take eight times longer to solve than an n dimensional problem so i end up with two n versus eight n on terms of scaling of time complexity so that it means the ratio is four so i save four times the amount of time if i solve it using symmetry and anti-symmetry as opposed to one full structure so that's really important to understand why we would go through this effort but this is much more profound than just this half often we can s solve uh, one quarter or we can solve one eighth in 3d often so there's lots of additional savings involved here okay so keep your eyes open make sure you can identify and think a little bit how you could apply su linear superposition with the symmetric and anti-symmetric boundary conditions to exploit computational effort again if you do one analysis it's maybe not so important but if you want to do optimization and you say oh i can s i can do analysis now four times faster and i need to do 100 of them or i can do it eight times faster and i need to do 100 of them that becomes very substantial and very useful to make sure that you know how to model properly